what time in history would you rather live in than now? Like, I mean, maybe the future, because the future could be better, but any time in the past, like if I was the king of Spain or France or something in the 13 or 1400s common era, I couldn't do the things that I, as a normal average middle-class person can do today. Like that is like the, you know, the, the top five or six people in the entire world. And I can't, I couldn't do the things I can go scuba diving. I can get on an airplane and within hours fly to a different country over an ocean. Uh, you know, I can, I can look out into the universe through telescopes that either I have or, uh, that, that you can look online and you can see, you know, the James Webb telescope things, you know, there's just the amount of information that we have. And of course the internet, the, the things that we can do, the amount of information that we have, the, the level of comfort we have, the quality of food and water that we have is better than anyone has had ever. Hey guys, and welcome to Connecting the Dots. I have the great pleasure of uh, having with me John Gibbs, also known as Dr. Know It All. He has a YouTube channel and he's also active on Twitter. And he is an AI expert, he has his own AI company, and his YouTube channel is really great. I recommend to everyone who doesn't know him to just rush over to his channel and watch it and subscribe. And it's a great pleasure for me because A, I'm a fan and also a Patreon. And B, the reason I'm having him here is we're talking about the road to abundance. Basically, we're Tesla had their AI day 2022. And in this event, they showed the Tesla bot. And we both shared the view that this is the first stepping stone towards a world of abundance. So we decided to make a two-part interview or discussion. The first part was on John's channel. So just go ahead uh, right now and go to his channel and watch the first part, which is basically about AI Day itself and about Tesla Bot. And once you're finished watching that episode, come back here and watch this part, which will be about the road to abundance, which means, okay, we have or will have Tesla Bot, or maybe other robots. We have labor, which is cheap and infinitely scalable. What other things do we need in order to get to a world of abundance? And what will life be in such a world? But before we go on, just John, can you just tell about yourself for a moment to those sure. who don't know you yet? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't even know if people on my channel know all this stuff, but I, my, my sort of real day job is I'm in, uh, an associate professor at the University of Georgia, which is a little bit east of Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. And I teach, I teach a variety of topics. I teach 3D animation, uh, some AI related topics, game engine work, script writing, <laughs> et cetera, it's design, sound design specifically. So I, I have my my fingers in a lot of pies, I guess would be the metaphor anyway. And then obviously do the YouTube channel, Dr. Know-It-All. And then also I uh, have a, a small company, Automatic.io, that you can go visit if you're interested, where we are working on applying AI um, techniques and, and, and solutions to 3D animation and digital art problems. So... I stay busy. <laughs> How's that? We were actually talking just before we started recording this about your friend and how busy she is. And I was like, I was like, I understand. <laughs> I know about being busy. <laughs> Life is busy when you're having fun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's never a day of work if you're enjoying yourself. So what does it matter? <laughs> guys, some of you know that the voice on my channel is different. And now, now you can see the CGI mask and so on. So basically, they want to keep this uh, YouTube part of my life and the work part of my life separate. So uh, I just have to use this mask and I use the narrator in my own videos. And putting this aside, let's uh, go on. In 2016, I finished working in a very strenuous project. It was a very demanding project, which was, I had a lot of satisfaction working there. It was very agile, a lot of fun and very meaningful. By the way, it's the one I sent you in the um, beforehand. Right. So once I finished working it, I had a lot of time on my hand because when you work a lot and then the pressure drops, you have time on for your hands and you want to use it. So I started looking into the future. I said, I looked around me and said, okay, what can I see? I started looking deep into the future. And I summed it up in some uh, a presentation, which I showed to friends at work. And later on, it grew. It started becoming a series of uh, presentations. 
which I showed to various audiences. And basically it was, became a deep look into the future. And uh, one thing it is was change my life because it brought me to know Tesla and start investing in Tesla. And uh, I invested before Tesla shot up to the sky. So that was lucky. Good, good for you. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> yeah. Not enough, by the way, but uh, <laughs> yeah. now I'm all in and so on. But back then, not enough. But uh, it definitely changed my prospects. But the other thing it did was just um, got me on the path of looking into the future, which was really interesting. And what I said there, basically, I said, let's look at why we are limited right now. The basic premise was, why is uh, science fiction still fiction? I mean, if you want something, what are the things stopping you from doing that? So I said, there are four, basically I counted four things. Others can count it differently. One of them was labor. Mm -hmm. We now are labor constrained. We have to work and we have a limited number of hours a day that we can work. The other was energy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to pay for energy to operate the machinery. And if you want to, um, if there are things that are very energy consuming and so on. Like if you want to get from here to Mars or to the right. moon, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, and we can see right now in Europe what's happening with energy. Oh, uh, yeah. The third thing was technology. And the technology, was, it said we have to advance technology enough so we can get there. And the fourth thing I saw was money. We have to make things cheap enough. Because right now, if you want to get to, the, uh, to Mars right now, you can't do it. In the future, it will cost a lot. But if it costs a lot, it's still science fiction for most people. Right. What will right. happen? How will we have a world of abundance where uh, what you can, what you, whatever you want, basically, within the laws of physics, you right. can eventually. <laughs> so um, I think uh, these are the four questions I want to debate with you and discuss with you. Um, before that, but, but first, let's uh, say something else. Will we reach a world of abundance? Or will we reach some kind of uh, dystopian world? Like, for example, like in the Hunger Games, where there is a ruling class and others that are ruled right. and have nothing. Or will oh. we have like a Terminator <laughs> that goes and uh, right. either finishes us, us like in Terminator or just <clears throat> by mistake finishes us, us off? So right. what are your views on this, John? Mm. So, wow. <laughs> Just ask the small questions, right? So uh, the first one, uh, just, just, yeah. just to bring up the first question is do you, do you see us heading to a dystopia or to an utopia or something in between? And I, uh, and why or what will change the course of events? Right. So I think that we have all of the ingredients to reach a utopia or, or, you know, I, I, maybe utopia is not quite the right term, but to reach an, an era where our problems are, are relatively small. Uh, you know, we, we, we can talk about like, Oh, I have an emotional problem. I had a bad day. That's not on the same level as I don't have any food to eat or no shelter or something. So my, my hope, and, and so, you know, saying utopia, I think a lot of times people have this idea that everyone is like perfectly happy all the time. That That's never going to happen because human nature is not, <laughs> it's just not that way. But what I hope is that our problems become problems that are, you know, personal, emotional, things like that, rather than physical and existential not problems where we don't know how to to feed ourselves we don't know how to find the energy we need as you said or or the, the shelter or things like that and so i believe that we have all the ingredients to get to that world of abundance as as you know as world events continuously show us however not all human beings and really not even most human beings but there's a enough human beings that always seem to find their way to power that have a very, very antagonistic view towards that. Because one of the things about this world of abundance is it's very democratic. It's very, 
it's sharing there there's a there's an equality in terms of and i don't want to sound like i'm being communist because <laughs> i think communism as a system does not work but the basic idea that we don't have to worry about it and that uh this this classism this striation that happens unfortunately there's just a group of people who are very very all about them having everything and everybody else having nothing um one of the things that i think has been the most amazing events like completely uh society shattering event is the internet uh, that's something and people don't give it enough credit i think we just sort of exist in it now but basically and, and i'm going to caveat this with something but basically those of us with high speed internet now have access to most of the world's information it's just there for the taking. Now, the caveat, of course, is that there is a large portion of the world's population right now that does not have access to that, which brings us to Elon Musk and his other industry, which is his other company, big company, which is SpaceX and Starlink specifically, which is starting to change that. It's starting to democratize the the way information is. Um, I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that information wants to be free. That uh, and you know I'm, I'm, I have a physics background and the universe is sort of informational in its own right. But basically, that this that that information has a kind of entropic form. If you try to collect it, you have a very very low entropy state where it's all really really centralized. And what it wants to do is it wants to reach a highly entropic state. It wants to disperse and it wants to get out. And, and so for people who are trying to hide information and hold it themselves, they have to do it by more and more desperate means. And, and that's what I see as the major threat to getting to this utopian-ish world that we could live in is, is really it comes down to human nature. There's unfortunately enough people in the world that are very antagonistic towards everybody having the same access to things that that seems to be the big thing i don't want to focus on that but that would be the thing that i would say like if i'm going to you know stay up at night and worry about things that's what i worry about okay and eventually right like eventually do you think which way will take uh, like say there could be bumps in the road yeah. right but <clears throat> uh let's say if you look 100 years from now let's look far away right i think 100 oh, wow. is a lot okay. Yeah, it's a long years ways. from now, do you see it utopia or dystopia? I, I don't really see two options. I see 100 years from now, either it's more this utopian view or maybe not humanity has collapsed, but civilization as a whole has collapsed. And, and okay. <laughs> so I don't really, I think we've reached a point right now that if we don't all cooperate and get along, it's it's world destroying. It's not something where, I know back in the old days, you know, France and England could have a fight with each other and they could mess up their little region of the world, but the whole rest of the world didn't care anything about it. But right now, everything is so interconnected if we don't all cooperate and try to climb that ladder. So I, I don't, so I certainly, I'm a very optimistic person by nature. So I certainly want it to be the former. I want it to be everyone has this world where they have universal basic income. They get to do what they want every day. I think we were talking about work and, you know, if you do what you love, it doesn't feel like work. So let people do what they love and not do things that they hate. So many people go to work every day right now only because they have to make enough money to buy food and buy shelter. And that's unfortunate. It'd be much nicer if everyone was able to do what they want, even if they just wanted to play video games all day. If that was the person's, if that's what they wanted to do, that's great. <laughs> that's not what I would do all day, but that's that's what some people would prefer to do. I'm with you about being an optimist. And I think that there will be hurdles along the way uh, as you said, there are people in power who want all the power to themselves and so on. But eventually, we will get to this, uh, what I said, this utopia. Uh, and why? Because it will be much better to these people, to these people in mm. power. Mm. And in other words, let's say you can say right now that uh, they have this, uh, once you get to a certain, a certain level, of uh, mil of billions or millions or, and so on. It doesn't really matter how much you have, but they still have this uh, competition between them of mine is bigger than yours and so on. Right. I have more than you have and so on. But uh, if you look at, at these uh, rich people, they have this security around them and so on. And they can't just go anywhere, uh, everywhere and so on, but they still have a lot of possibilities, lots of possibilities. In the future, 
what will happen? Let's go through dystopia first. In a right. dystopia, let's say this, we reach a stage, and this stage will happen, that bots replace us in factories and so on, because they work better than us. Right. And bots will replace uh, even white-collar jobs. There are already, we already have uh, <clears throat> accountant bots that do the tax. Uh, I mean, it's just machines, not uh, humanoid robots. But they do the tax reforms and so on, which used to be done by humans before, right. human accountants and so on. And you have law bots, lawyer bots, which do things also cer- certain things better than humans and so on. And uh, um, in my presentation back then, I showed that um, w- a movie when they they did a trailer for to a movie back in 2018 using AI, and uh, it was it was great. It was amazing. I'll send you a link later on. Right. So um, basically, it's astounding what can be done. It will replace all of us. So let's go to this world and let's say these people in power who own, we'll call them capitalists right now because they own the means of production, <clears throat> but I'm not taking this into capitalism versus communism and so on or socialism. I'm not going this route. I just want to drive along what will happen. So let's say they own the means of production and they can produce or buy or whatever, buy from Elon or other companies, as many right. boxes that they want and produce as much as they want. Okay. What happens? They produce lots of things. First thing, who will buy them? Right. You and I, we don't have any money. Right. We're not working. <laughs> we don't have any money to buy it from them. They need us, like Henry Ford did, when he paid good salaries to his workers so they can buy his thing, his cars. We right. will have to get to have money to be able to buy the goods that these billionaires produce. Right. And the other thing is, let's say, forget it, they'll just build their own worlds and so on. They won't give us any money or they'll give us like in the Hunger Games just so we can survive. Right. What will happen is you'll have these few billionaires and they won't be able to go anywhere without lots and lots of armed guards around them because the mobs will just want to revolt because we don't have anything and they have everything. Right. right. I think that the basic premise of why the the system should work is um, if our lives are good, then we are, we can be very, if we have a good life and we have enough right. ourselves, we don't care that others have more. Some do, but basically, uh, you don't. You don't really. Some compare themselves to the others, <clears throat> but you don't need to compare if your life is good. If your life is bad and you don't have anything, then you start comparing and you want to revolt. So right. basically, there's these people in power. My assumption is that they will eventually uh, go to the root of going through this kind of UBI. And, but it won't be a universal basic income. It will be a general income. We will all have a lot of, lot of money or a lot of right. uh, uh, purchase, purchasing power. Let's leave money aside sure. for a moment. Sure. A lot of purchasing power because otherwise they won't have anyone buying their stuff and they will have to protect themselves all the time from us. Right. And if we're right. happy, they can be much more, much happier themselves. Right. I, I think you brought up a really, really, I, I'm going to answer two two different points to this. I think they're both really good. One of them is um, that the economy, it's not like linear, it's circular, right? You know, somebody manufactures a product, somebody purchases that product with money that they made making another product or doing something else. And it goes, so it's, it hopefully spirals up. So you're right. Everyone is interconnected. You don't, if you're a billionaire and everyone else has zero money, like what good does it do to have that money? <laughs> it, because you don't have anything you can buy with your billions of dollars and you have to secure yourself because everyone's going to try to kill you because they're going to be upset. So that's number one. And then the second thing I always think about is what time in history would you rather live in than now? Like, I mean, maybe the future because the future could be better, but any time in the past, like if I was the king of Spain or France or something in the 13 or 1400s common era, I couldn't do the things that I, as a normal average middle-class person can do today. Like that is like the, you know, the, the top five or six people in the entire world 
And I can't, I couldn't do the things I can go scuba diving. I can get on an airplane and within hours fly to a different country over an ocean. Uh, you know, I can, I can look out into the universe through telescopes that either I have or uh, that, that you can look online and you can see, you know, the James Webb telescope things, you know, there's just the amount of information that we have. And of course the internet, uh, you know, the, the things that we can do, the amount of information that we have, the, the level of comfort we have, the quality of food and water that we have is better than anyone has had ever. And so yeah, hopefully people realize that and want to keep ratcheting that up so it gets better and better. Uh, you know, Alejandro, I think mm -hmm. in interview too, he has right. this moment, it's called, and this uh, YouTube channel, it's called The Best Moment in History. Right. And the name of this channel it refers to now. We right. are living in the best moment in history. Right. And I think that you, there are bumps along the road. Like <clears> if, you, <throat> if you look at someone who was born in the 1900, then he had to pass through two world wars and maybe he didn't survive. Or people in Ukraine right now, right. Um, they right. bad things happen to them and so on. Right. But if you look at things like... Uh, it's just like Tesla stock for them. If you look at it, there right. are, it's very volatile, right? But there's also a trend which is going up, right? So we're just improving and improving, and it's going up exponentially, right? So I, I, in in my, um, I'm going back to this uh, presentation I did in 2018 and so on. I had this slide there. It was a very um, poor quality GIF picture. You saw this person climbing on a cliff. And I said, oh, we, we are reaching this place where this expo exponent we're living on is very, very steep. Right. I, just, I showed uh, Moore's law in the beginning. Even right. Now I didn't show Wright's law. Uh, but you can just see that everything is just climbing up. So we're just going in and accelerating and accelerating. And the exponential is getting very, very steep. And if we look forward, then we can be sure that we don't fall off this cliff. Right. If we fall off the cliff, like you see in this uh, GIF picture, that uh, GIF image that this guy falls off, falls down, but then he has a parachute, parachute. Right. So basically, we're just climbing up and up and up. And if we look forward enough, then we'll have this parachute with us or we won't fall. And I think it's a very exciting ride. And um, right. let's go on because I can diverge all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, basically, um, okay, so we said, uh, I think we both see the future as basically optimistic. So let's go through this optimistic route. route. Yeah, uh, it's more absolutely. fun going that way. I, right. I personally think we'll go that way. I think so. Do you? And basically, yeah, it's more fun going that way. Right. So, uh, what do you think is needed besides labor? Uh, let's start mm -hmm. with one. Sure. Working. Well, actually, I, I do want to talk about labor for a moment because I think um, it's not just Teslabot, although Teslabot will be the ultimate labor saving thing. But I think that uh, I'll just give you an example. And this isn't a monetary labor savings yet, but you can see where this is going. And that is that last night we our, our son was uh, in a place that was about uh, 100 miles away or 160 kilometers away. And as it turns out, the way that we had to drive was all back roads, you know, windy, windy, windy stuff, construction, stoplights, stop signs, things like that, and generally fairly high speeds. We drove the Tesla and the Tesla drove us, you know, and it did it, the FSD beta, and it took us there and it took us back again. And and then back it was after dark and, you know, I'm kind of tired and I'm not that young anymore. So my eyesight's not as good as it used to be. So the, I believe that the car was actually safer than me last night driving because it, it sees better at night. So that is, that's not yet a monetary thing, but think about how much labor that saved. You know, I didn't get home. You know how if you drive a really long time, you get home and you're exhausted and you're just like, oh gosh, it was terrible. Uh, th none of that kind of stuff because the car was taking on the bulk of the work. So now let's all we have to do is project that out a year or two in advance. And we talked about this in the first half of like when I predicted robo taxis. But but when we get to robo taxis, that then becomes a monetary advantage because it doesn't cost the consumer as much to get from point A to point B because you don't have to have a human being in the car. And in terms of labor, you've just taken away 
that labor. Now, there's going to be people who are going to say, wait, but people need to work. People need to work. So sure, <laughs> you can make that argument. And that is one of the bumps in the road. But in terms of increasing the world's economy, think about like every single um, every single truck that's that's moving goods or, or a ship or an airplane or any of these kinds of things that's transporting goods around the world that is part of our labor pool and what we have to buy, <laughs> the stuff that we have to buy to keep living. If, if you can start removing human beings from that, that's one of the major expenses of those things. So you can reduce the cost of goods and reduce the labor that's necessary for it. And again, people will say, oh yeah, but we're getting rid of a, of a, of a, a big chunk of the world's economy. I say yes and no. Number one, it's certainly in the trucking industry, at least in the United States, there aren't nearly enough truckers and a lot of them are actually my age. So they're getting very close to retirement age. And, and so what happens after that? Um, I don't see an awful lot of 20 year olds who want to, to like go into trucking. <laughs> so, so number one is that there's just not enough uh, people to fulfill that industry. So that's number one. But even beyond that, like maybe these people can go to more managerial positions or work in logistics or something like that. Right. So there, people always adjust. <laughs> it seems like when, when you take away one job, people find another job to do that. When I was a kid, I actually, like when I was in, uh, I think it was undergraduate school, I did temporary work in the summers where I was a secretary and I like typed and I would go into the boss. It was a, it was an insurance company and I worked for them and I would go in and he would say things and I would like write it down really fast. I don't do shorthand, but anyway, and then I go type it all up and it's like, that's not necessary anymore. I can just do speech to text if I wanted to, or type it myself. Right. So that position that, that the traditional secretary position has disappeared. And yet we don't have this gigantic hole in the labor force because that's gone. People have found other jobs and hopefully better jobs and ones that are more fulfilling than that. So, so I think that it's worth noting that even something that could happen within the next year or two, which is uh, 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 cars that are able to drive themselves, can begin to have a massive impact on the economy because it allows that labor effectively to go up. And then you throw in a humanoid robot that can be dropped into any job that a human can do. Again, starting with relatively simple stuff, but eventually getting to pretty much most of the things that human beings can do, they can do it as well or better. And then you're right. It just kind of like, what is the limit? Elon Musk even said that. He's like, what really is the limit to the economy since it's just labor? That's all but money is too, right? Money is just labor, <laughs> effectively. <laughs> I, I think there's something that's very interesting. If you look at AI day, how it was, um, but... Uh, Basically, if you look at AI day number one from previous year, it was, we have FSD. Right. And we have uh, Dojo. And yeah, one more thing where it's starting to work about the uh, bot and so on. It was a side issue, like, look, we're starting to work right. on this. Right. This time, it was, look, we have the bot. And we are about to, and besides the bot, yeah, we have also FSD and so on, which are converging to a solution and so on. So it's a huge difference, right? basically. Like it was the main thing right now, the bot, and I think it's going to change the world. Right. Yeah. My, 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 actually, I said this to somebody while I was at the AI Day event before the presentations. I said, I really feel like what Tesla is doing is painting themselves in a corner a little bit because the big negative that they're going to come up with is if they solve too many of these problems, the the interested students and professionals are going to say there's, there's nothing left to work on. So it's kind of an interesting little problem. Now, I think there's a long ways to go before we get there, but it is kind of a weird thing to think about is that they could eventually you know, well, I mean, it's not just them, it's everybody out of a job because eventually like the, these, these things will become smart enough to design their own problems and to figure out the, the solutions to those problems before human beings can even conceptualize what the problem is. So what a weird world that will be. Yeah. Basically it's, I talked about my friend, my friend after this AI day, she said that AI day will be remembered in history as a stepping stone for humanity, humanity, something like that. I don't remember right. the exact phrase, but she said it will be remembered in history books of the future. Right. And Is that that was this one? This was the 2022 one? 
Uh, she said something like that about the first one. Oh, the first one. After okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Just showed by the way she talked about just the day after AI day, she had this rant about they're going to take all the good AI people and they're going to right. reach the, <laughs> right. they're going to make the bots and they're going to go and make AGI also. She looked forward and then she right. saw it happening. So um, this uh, after this AI day, a few days later or the day later, she put on her Facebook something like uh, the first AI day. She said, I said this <clears throat> and I'm reiterating it and also right. saying it about the current AI day. Uh, it's a major stepping stone in the journey of humanity. I don't remember how she phrased it. Right, right. Um, that's interesting because um, I was talking to Dave Lee before the event, and and he said the reason he was so excited to go was because he thought this was this past one. But he said, "I believe this is going to be looked back on as one of the historical moments in yeah. in you know in, in society that that people will like teach in the history books and say like this was the date." And so and so that made me even more excited to be there or to you know participate in some uh, degree. But you know, so it it is really and it, the problem of course is when you're living through it, you don't notice it, but certainly i would i would think that if we look back in maybe 5 or 10 years we should already realize the importance of 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 this date these two ai days actually uh, by the way to all of the tesla investors uh, right now we talked i think in the first part about our expectations about when tesla will start replacing workers in the factory itself and we uh, agreed that we both think that in the before AI day 2023, which means in the upcoming year, and I will say in less than half a year, year from now, it will already start replacing, actively replacing, not for training purposes, people in the factory, which means that looking forward, a few years from now, and really very few years from now, the factories will be able to A, work much cheaper because labor is a major expense right. and be much faster because of the bots will be able to do it uh, in ways that humans cannot and they don't tire and so on and so on. So to all those Tesla investors out there, we have a very bright future, not investment advice, of course, but uh, in my optimistic view, uh, it's amazing. Right, right. And I think, um, can we shift over to creative work? Because I think that's a, it's, I think people kind of segment that out. So they're like, okay, yeah, fine. It can pick up these objects, but a robot will never replace an artist or uh, some an, an engineer who has to think creatively about a solution to a problem. Um, but I think that this is outside of Tesla specifically, but OpenAI has a lot to do with this. And that's another Elon Musk founded company, but the, that we're seeing evidence that the rate of acceleration of the way that AI is invading our world is it's so rapid right now. But things like Dolly 2 and, and uh, Stable Diffusion and Imogen and those types of programs are showing us just, the, well, what you've got behind you, right? Yeah. You said that was AI generated, right? So yeah. yeah, exactly. So like you said something like, I want a Tesla gauntlet like an arm, like armored gauntlet or something. And that's what it produced. Now it's not perfect yet. Cause obviously it doesn't quite have the hand. It's got these weird two long thumb things, but, but it's the beginning of this process. It's like, what is going to be in a year? It, it will be able to do these creative jobs. And a lot of people are like, well, wait, that's again, it's going to take our jobs. It's going to take our jobs. I kind of hearken it back to a tool like Photoshop uh, because I'm old enough to remember before Photoshop and doing things like doing any kind of retouching on a photograph or um, designing, or I remember doing the yearbook in the 1980s, like for high school, where you actually had to cut the things out and glue them onto the pages. And then they went off to some printer or something. It was incredibly tedious, right? And now we have all of these tools that let people who like me, who are not brilliant, like artists or anything, but I can do design, I can move things around and fade them in and out. So it's expanded the amount of humanity that's able to do this and really, really reduce the cost, right? So it used to be a very expensive thing. If you wanted a designer to design you something, you're going to have to pay for it. And then you have to wait for it. And then you have to hope you get it right. And now you can do all of those things very, very rapidly for a very inexpensive price. 
And so I think that we're going to look at creative tools, like whether it's engineering or things, as it uh, as a cooperative thing where the, the rising tide lifts all boats, rather than competitive. I, I, I hope. <laughs> I think that's the way we'll look at it. <laughs> Basically, I think we talked about labor um, going right. forward. Uh, and, and as you said, labor is not just in <clears throat> um, manufacturing and uh, blue collar jobs and so on, driving and so on. It's also in uh, white collar jobs and uh, we can see the art and so on. And they will replace us. Uh, either, right. either humanoid bots or just uh, programs running on servers and so on. But uh, looking forward, I said, uh, we also need energy. I think we can skip right. this stage or talk about it very briefly because right. uh, basically <clears throat> if people want to check about energy, I think we can both agree that there will be a world of abundant energy. It's just a matter of time. As uh, Tony Sieber right. talked about it, I recommend that everyone go and watch his presentations about the future of energy and so on. What he says is that if we just use solar, for example, solar or wind and so on, we can have uh, with just a very small amount of uh, solar panels, we can just energize the entire world. And if we want to do it so in the most uh, in the most consumpt consumptive or whatever, in the day when, when we have the most demand and we have the least sun, we will right. still have energy, then it means we have to put enough solar panels and so on to have about five times the energy we need in normal days. So energy will become very, very cheap because right. we have a nuclear reactor just above us in the sky. Right. So <laughs> energy will become very, very cheap. There won't be any cost to energy. It will be just uh, almost free or ultimately free. Right. Right. Basically, yeah, I, I will say the one thing that I, I thought when I was a kid, I always thought that fusion was going to be the answer. But that was at a time when solar was very, very, very inefficient and very expensive. But what's happened is fusion has stayed extremely expensive and very technically difficult to achieve. But as you say, we have a fusion reactor that's, uh, what, about 150,000 or 145,000 kilometer, million kilometers away from us uh, in space. And so that's a freebie. We, we just have to basically, you know, start sucking in that power. So yes, I, th I think we have a very, very high probability of reaching an uh, overabundance of energy. So next point. <laughs> uh, uh, and some other things that also did, that happened between when we were kids to now is also uh, energy storage, which enabled the solar energy to be 24-7, which we didn't have it back then. So... Right. Yeah. And I mean, look at, we're, we're driving electric cars. I remember I was in sixth grade and I did a project where I built an electric motor and put a little toy car on top of it. And I said, look, this is great. But the problem at the time was, you remember those big square batteries? They were called lantern cells, I think, with the little spirals on top. It, but that's what I was using. But effectively that battery weighed more than the entire car. So, you know, so it, it was not, you know, my little sixth grade brain, you know, 12 year old brain wasn't conceiving of that, but it was not very efficient. And of course you couldn't recharge the battery, but that's a huge change. We've gotten to batteries with incredible energy density. I mean, I'm talking to you for what well, we're going to talk for two hours before this is over. And I've got these little tiny headphones with little tiny batteries in them. And then when I get done, I'll stick them in here. And in a couple hours, they'll be recharged. So it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And they're cheap. And they're cheap. I mean, yeah. Basically, if you, if you go on uh, AliExpress right now. Right. And you want to buy a smartphone from three years ago or something like that, or with capabilities of three years ago, you can get it almost for free. Right. And... Uh, or 50 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever. Right. And if you look like not so far back, it's a supercomputer. <laughs> right. The other points I saw that stops this world of abundance or technology, but we just see it evolving all the time and this AI uh, and simulations and so on running through these prog uh, problems and they will uh, progress through it and um, this just be becomes um, more and more efficient and better and better. So I don't right. see technology stopping us. It's an ever-progressing <clears throat> um, 
ramp or exponential. Right. I, I and, think the technology, as long as society is is whole and uh, stable, <laughs> that technology will just naturally progress, right? The, the The danger to technology is the existential danger to everybody, which is that society as a whole could collapse. But if if things remain stable, technology is going to keep improving. Yeah. yeah. So. And the final thing I sold was price, but I think this uh, is very, we see that we just talked that everything is getting cheaper and cheaper and we're not do, now doing things that not long ago, billionaires would have done it in a much worse manner than we are doing right now <laughs> very easily. So right. uh, I, I think even uh, there was this talk, uh, we were talking about robot taxis and that eventually uh, rides will be very, very cheap or even free. Like if you go to a, a restaurant, then they will mm. pay for the ride. <clears throat> right. You can see ads on the wind for the ride. I saw like a few, um, about a year ago before, or two years ago before, or the uh, recent downturns, there were talks about even flights, intra uh, right. flights between countries uh, becoming uh, free. There was this company that said they will do it because basically they can get from local tourist agencies and so on. Right. They can get uh, the, these deals that just bring us, bring people to our country, and they're leaving enough money in our country for us to give you for the uh, uh, ticket and so on. Right. And everything is getting so so cheap and so right. free. I'm really optimistic about this future. Uh, and that actually brings up the, I mean, the question of money because currently we. I don't have my wallet with me. It's all numbers now anyway. But, you know, it used to be, again, you had a, 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 a an item, a physical thing that represented your money. And then over time, that became less and less important. And now it's just numbers. So the even the concept of, like, we talk about universal basic income or universal generous income or something. But if things are, are inexpensive enough that it's very, very easy to just get them all, then money becomes less meaningful also, right? I think that's the other thing that's important to think about is that this concept that we have of like, ooh, he has a billion dollars and I only have a million and I only have a thousand and I have zero, you know, that that, that sort of that sort of comparison won't be so important anymore when you can get what you not only need, but what makes your life good. There's an episode in Star Trek Oh, where they have this, uh, they find this uh, small spaceship with uh, someone uh, frozen inside. And basically it's someone from the, I think our century, the right. 21st century. And uh, she's, uh, um, she had some kind of terminal disease and she froze herself and she got frozen before death in uh, the hope that in the future, someone will be able to cure her. And this is what happens. They found this uh, spaceship, this capsule, and they take her outside. They scan her and they see that uh, she has this disease and they fix it. They cure her. Right. And when she, when she wakes up, she asks, what year are we now? And they tell her it's in the future. And she jumps in the air and says, wow, I'm rich. I'm rich. I invested <laughs> everything in the index funds and so on. Right. I'm rich. And I have so much money. And they look at her and say, what's money? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they have everything, but they don't have any money because there's no need for it. Because as right. I said, like, like if, if I, if you did a service for me and the cost of this service would be like a cent, you tell me, I can, don't worry. Don't send me this. Right. I don't care. <laughs> right. uh, leave it. So in the future, this will all happen. And uh, even this capitalism and so on, I see it. I'm not talking right now about politics and so on, right. but basically I think everything will change because right now we are built on limited resources. So the one that owns the factory wants to gain more resources and he gets it by selling us stuff. And we right. happily, sometimes happily give these resources to him uh, or to her or whatever, to, to them for the products they give us and so on. And we sell either our work or other stuff to other people and so on. As you said, the circular economy, right, which grows exactly. and grows. But in the future, when let's say you're the biggest capitalist in the world, you have large factories and so on. But I have my bots. Right. I can produce anything I want. 
Right. I can tell them, okay, produce more bots, <clears throat> uh, get stuff, and so on. Maybe it won't be. Maybe it won't be as efficient than you than what you sell. But I can get it anyway. Right. Uh, so I don't care, and so on. So eventually, it'll be a thing that they. I think, I assume, that there won't be any meaning when, let's say, when resources when there's a limited pie. Mm -hmm. There's a meaning to which slice of the pie each of us gets. And I and the pie is constantly growing. So it's right. fine that some people get more and we get less as long as we all have, right? In the future, when you see the pie as ver practically unlimited, then there's no meaning of which slice of the pie you own right. because whatever you want... Your slice is constantly <laughs> growing, and um, it's much bigger than you can even use. Right, I, I, I think actually what you said is actually is is crucial. The idea of all of us having access to labor. I mean, if you think about some of the things that are are, are really annoying, I don't know, I, <laughs> I own a house, so you know, it's like it seems like the roof needs to be repaired, or the air conditioner needs to be redone, or somebody needs to crawl up in the ducts and do something, or clean out the gutters. Those are all labor costs, but even if you don't personally own a robot, if you can rent one for basically, you know, very, very cheap uh, at any point, and you're just, just like the robo taxis, right? I need to go from here to the restaurant to eat some food. It's like, instead, I need to have my gutters cleaned and you get on an app and in 10 minutes or whatever, an hour, you know, the robot shows up and it cleans it and it costs you $5, right? It, we're starting to work towards this thing of like, well, the primary cost of that is the human being having to come out here and then having to feed his children or her children or whoever, you know, and, and so they, they charge money. And so you pay hundreds of dollars or something. So it could be orders of magnitude, less money that you're paying a robot to do it and you can get it faster even if you don't own one. So, you know, even the idea of owning a robot might not be that important. It might be if there's just a pool of robots out there, just like a pool of cars, that you don't have to own this stuff anymore. So it doesn't come down to owning it. It's just you have access to the labor. If you want the labor, you can get the labor for really inexpensive and do whatever it is you want to do. I think this is a great play, place to stop with this <laughs> optimistic view of the future and so on. Uh, John, it's been a real pleasure for me uh, being on your show and also yeah. hosting you here. And for and, me as well. Uh, I really, will gladly do it again anytime. Cool. So thank you very much. It's been a great talk. And everyone, if you watch this uh, episode, then go to Dr. Know It's All channel. You'll have links below. Sign up to his uh, Twitter account and to his uh, YouTube account, and I assure right. you, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> right there, we go for either of us. We'll go oh. both directions because oh. I love your your Twitter feed is awesome. I I love to watch what you post on Twitter, so for sure. <laughs> so yeah, let's just leave it with a beautiful future and everything is wonderful. <laughs> we can we can agree that that's a lovely lovely way to think about things. All right. Okay. So thank you very much and. Uh, Guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode and bye. Bye-bye.